Well, it's, a, it's an incredible honor um, having you here, Peter. I feel like uh, across industry, there's probably no one that's more like a peer than you are, uh, being uh, the, the original research director at Google. Uh, so it's great to have you visit at Microsoft Research today. I wanted to just start with, um, I know you've had such a, a, a rich and interesting career to date and much more to come, but you, you did your undergrad at Brown right. in applied math, and, and then you went off to Berkeley. What was your thinking about what you wanted to do back then, and, and, uh, and why did you choose that grad school and path? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I was an applied math major as an undergrad because the computer science major didn't exist. There was something like a computer science program, but it, it, uh, you, you couldn't be a major in that. Also, uh, some of the classes, to me, felt like uh, it's a class in IBM assembly language, and so I took the interesting computer classes. Uh, then I felt like, uh, gee, four years of college, that's enough. I don't want to go to grad school. I uh, worked in a, what we would now call a startup company for two years. Uh, after two years of that, I said, uh, gee, it took me two years to get tired of work. Maybe I like school twice as much. <laughs> yeah. And I'd lived my whole life in New England, and I had friends who had gone out to California. So I said, uh, well, that's the thing for me. And so I applied to Stanford and Berkeley, and uh, both schools unanimously agreed I should go to Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> so that's where I ended up. Uh, I was interested in, in AI and, in particular, uh, natural language. I knew uh, Bob Walensky was there. But what, what, what was your, like, what got you interested in that, though? What was the, the background on that, would you, you think? Know, I, I think maybe it goes back to uh, high school. And I was lucky enough to be in a high school that had both a computer class. Uh, you know, we were on a uh, teletype uh, connected to a PDP-1 or something like that in, in BASIC. And we also had a linguistics class. And so I took those two classes and uh, said to my teacher, uh, you know, maybe these two are related. Uh, this, this linguistic stuff seems like there's a formal language there, and the computer stuff seems like that can make it work. And my teacher very wisely says, yeah, yes, there's something there, but uh, you don't know enough to do it yet. And, and, you, and at Berkeley, you dove into, into understanding stories with Bob. And, yeah, and yeah. how did that evolve? What was your experience with that? So, uh, you know, I started out by saying, uh, well, there's this, there's this stuff we can do in linguistics to understand sentences, but really, the interesting thing about language is what does it mean, <clears throat> not just how do the sentences work. And we're still worrying, worrying about that today. Actually. We're still worrying about that today, <laughs> yeah. right? And so, uh, you know, if, as we're reading a story, what's left unsaid? Uh, can we answer questions yeah. about the story? And so I worked on that. And I, <clears throat> I guess my main experience was saying this is too hard to do by hand. And the way we did things back then was uh, by introspection, and you wrote out by hand uh, statements in a knowledge representation language, and you wrote inference rules, and then you tried it, and you know, you do like uh, one paragraph a month, uh, and then you'd get that working, but then they would have broken half of the things you had before. Uh, and so, you know, I managed to stumble across the finish line and get a thesis done, but it was clear that this writing out knowledge by hand just was not scalable. And there, I thought there were two problems. Uh, one was we, we tried to have the representation language basically be uh, logical. Uh, and uh, you know, as I was finishing up, I was just beginning to come around to the probabilistic side. And, and you and Heckerman were part of that. Uh, Pete Jeesman was part of that. And I think mostly uh, Udaya Pearl. I remember uh, sitting in a lecture the, the moment that he converted me. And I said, aha, uh, he's got the right idea, and, and this is the way we're going to have to go, and that's going to give us a lot more flexibility. And then the second part was shifting from this uh, handcrafted knowledge representation to machine learning, to say, let's learn from examples rather than trying to do it all by ourselves. And from there, uh, everything got, got easier, and we got to the point where instead of doing a paragraph at a time, we're doing billions of pages at a time. And before we get to that, that current, current state of affairs, so you, you, you did a number of things, but then I recall you being very salient to the community that Peter Norva was now at NASA. Yeah, and, um, right. and, and what <clears throat> motivated that, uh, that role? And, and, and you going to NASA? Were you, were you a space fan over the years? Or? Yeah, so, so it's interesting. And, and I know uh, you've spent some time in, involved as yes. well. Uh, 
And I was actually a, a, a NASA a, a NASA Ames Research Center graduate fellow. They funded some yeah, of my PhD yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. Um, so I, I just thought it was really cool. And I think uh, uh, in my time there, you saw there was two types of people, right? So there were some who wanted to be an astronaut since they were three years old and couldn't think of working anywhere else but NASA. And then there were some who just said, this is a really cool application of the computer science that I'm doing, and I could be here or I could be in another place that had another type of cool application. And during that era, there was a lot of interest, I remember, in an automated scientist. How can we make new, new, yeah. develop new kinds of autonomy for space? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was at the sort of the infancy of the robotics industry, and uh, space was one of the places where it was cost effective. <laughs> you needed a robot pretty badly. Where you need a robot really badly, and you can save uh, many, many millions or hundreds of millions of dollars by sending a robot rather than a person, because uh, the person doesn't need a return ticket, um, among other reasons. Uh, and so it was a great application for that. It was, a, it was also a turning point in my career, because it was really the first time that I went from being an individual contributor or managing a small group to managing a, a big group. In fact, I think you were like at one point in time the chief scientist at, at NASA uh, for computer science, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I would. Well, go that far, you're not doing the not, whole universe, not, but all, but not, not, not the whole galaxy, but a, they, but a nice sector yeah. of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And so, so anything particularly pop out as being remarkable, a remarkable memory from your NASA days? I mean, I guess, I guess one uh, cool memory I, I had was uh, being at, uh, uh, waiting for a shuttle launch. Uh, it ended up not going off, but just uh, sitting there with some of the old timers and, and hearing what they had to say. And uh, Bob Sabley was there. He was the navigator on uh, Apollo 13. So it was his job when the, uh, uh, the power went out in the capsule he had to say, how are we going to get home? And they have fiducial marks in the windows. So he calculated, line up this mark with that star and this other mark with that <laughs> other star and fire the rockets for two and a half seconds. And you'll get home. And, and if I'm wrong, <laughs> you die. Oh, gosh. Well, let's say, well, like, you'll get home. I like that one better. Yeah. So, so um, uh, now I know these days with, uh, with the rise of, uh, of interest and capabilities in AI, there's lots of interest in safety and robustness. and just going back to your NASA days, um, there were um, two failures, I think, on your watch that mm -hmm. were quite newsworthy, not at the level of Apollo 13 per, per the stakes, but, but still uh, interesting and um, uh, with messages for us. And I, you wrote about one of them quite extensively. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, when I was there, Dan Golden was the administrator. He had this motto, faster, better, cheaper which meant when you screw up, uh, you only lost $100 million rather than a billion dollars. <laughs> and people. <laughs> right, and no people. So uh, uh, the planets line up every two years or so, and there's an opportunity to launch. So we launched two in 98. Uh, they both failed. To Mars. To, to Mars, sorry. And uh, one of them was famous. It was this metric versus English uh, conversion. And uh, my conclusion there was really an issue of software reuse because we took the code that had run from the previous mission and reused it. Uh, but in the previous mission, it was just telemetry data that was non-critical to navigation in any way, so it wasn't really reviewed. Uh, but in this new mission, it became, it was uh, sort of uh, went into the side and became part of the path, the critical path into navigation. And so nobody really remembered that it was important <laughs> and that they should check it out. And some intern had uh, used the wrong units. And uh, you know, when you're going to Mars, if you're 99.999% .999 accurate, uh, that's not enough. Right, you need that last couple of miles out, out of your somehow 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 uh, meters to feet doesn't seem like a, a point zero 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 nine problem. It seems bigger than no, that. but it could be. But what it was is it was uh, measuring the solar wind on the uh, panels and how much that would uh, shift oh, I see. the spaceship. So that's a really tiny Small amount, amount that but it was enough to screw it up. And then the the other ones, the uh, Mars Polar Lander. Uh, so I th so I think the thing there is we should have better models of uh, reality and embrace uncertainty rather than try to get rid what of it. What happened with that one? Uh, 
we think, we're not 100% sure, but we think what happened is uh, the spaceship comes in and there's uh, three phases of control for how you land. Mm -hmm. So one, there's a, a burn and then you're completely out of contact as it goes around the planet. So it's just uh, decelerating. Then you start to get into the Martian atmosphere and you're coming down under a parachute. Not much atmosphere there, so the parachute doesn't slow you that much. And then, uh, and there's a radar detecting how far you are above the ground. And when you get to, I think it was something like 20 meters, I forget the exact number, uh, the radar becomes unreliable because things are bouncing. And so then you just uh, look for the touchdown sensors. And so the, the ship has legs on it. Uh, and there's sort of a collar there, which is a, a Hall effect sensor. And when it hits the ground, the leg punches up goes past the sensor and you cut off the engine because you've hit ground. And what they didn't realize, because it's hard to test in, uh, in zero gravity, is that when the legs first unfolded, they bounced and set off that sensor. And so what happened is you got down to 20 meters and you said, okay, now I'm going to shift from uh, paying attention to the radar to pay attention to the sensor. And a millisecond later, they made that shift, and they said, oh, well, the sensor's already gone off, so now I'm going to turn off the engines. Right? And from a software engineering point of view, if you think of deterministic software, this is a pretty good design because we know that the, uh, the more complex the interface between two systems, the more chances they are to screw it up. So if you have a small interface between two systems, that's a good software design. But if you're trying to model the real world, where there's uncertainty, then you don't want a small interface. You want to pass as much information as possible, right? So the, the radar phase should have told the touchdown phase, I think I'm at 20 meters. And if the touchdown phase says, I'm at zero meters a millisecond later, it said, no, that can't happen. I don't calling, believe Calling you. alert, calling Thomas Bayes to the, uh, to yeah, the rescue. Exactly. <laughs> Too late, though, in this right. case. But we, uh, we didn't have it then, and, and I think over time uh, we're getting better. And the other thing that, uh, that came out of this is, uh, so I was on these review boards, we go to these meetings, and it's uh, uh, Lockheed and JPL, and on the one hand, they're very scientifically trying to get to the bottom of what went wrong, and on the other hand, they're kind of subtly trying to blame the other guy. And uh, so I'm sitting in these all-day PowerPoint presentations, and one day in the morning uh, break, I noticed that uh, Bob Sackheim doesn't come back. He's a longtime uh, veteran, and at one point, every landing on a foreign body that had been successful, he had worked on, and every one that had failed, he had not worked on. What was his role? Uh, he's a propulsion engineer. Uh, so he doesn't come back to the, to the panel. And uh, you know, later in the day, he still didn't come back. Finally, he comes back and says, Bob, where'd you go? And he said, these PowerPoint presentations were going nowhere. I went down the hall, found one of my old buddies. We went over it. Now I understand what's going on, and you don't. <laughs> I see. Uh, so I went back to my uh, hotel that night, and I was thinking about, you know, is, is PowerPoint really the problem? And that's when I wrote the Gettysburg PowerPoint presentation. Hmm. Say a bit more about that Gettysburg PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so, so I just had this idea that uh, uh, sometimes these presentation tools stop you from getting to where you want to go rather than, than help you. And so I wanted to have an example of that, and I thought of the, the great speeches in history, and I, I took Lincoln's Gettysburg and turned it into a PowerPoint presentation, and I, uh, you know, you had, uh, what's it called, a wizard or, or something? And I thought, uh, I'm going to have to work really hard to make this presentation look really bad, and I'm going to have to choose some terrible colors and so on. And, and fortunately, the, the wizard kind of did it all for me. <laughs> <laughs> it made it really bad uh, without me even really trying to, hard, to try hard. You're trying to make me feel good as a Microsoft person right now, Peter. Uh, I think it's much better now. <laughs> okay. But, but at that point, uh, in 98, uh, 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 it was easy to make a really bad presentation. You even had the office assistant helping you back then. Yeah, the little yeah, clippy was yeah, waving yeah, at yeah, you, yeah. right? Right. But, and, and you hear stories of like uh, when, the, when Lou Gerstner took over at IBM, they started giving him presentations and he just went over and turned off the machine and just said, tell me about your business. Exactly. Let's have a conversation. And I think that's the way to do it. So I remember uh, being surprised when I heard that you went off to Google, a, a, a yeah. smallish startup. And I even remember sitting at a, a AAA Fellows dinner and we 
you had a bunch of questions about search and we were answer, trying to answer them together that were coming to the fore for you at the, in, yeah. in your day job. And yeah. what was that like and why did you make that leap to Google back then? Uh, what year was that, by the way? Uh, so that was 2001. And uh, one of the reasons was I had been at NASA for three years. Uh, three years of government bureaucracy starts to wear you down. Uh, we had recently had a presidential election. It took a little bit longer than normal to decide who won. Uh, but even before it was decided, uh, both candidates had said they were going to replace the NASA administrator. So I thought, you know, there's going to be a year at NASA when nothing happens. Uh, Interesting. So if you're going to leave, this is the time to leave. And then I started to look around and think about it. And uh, uh, I guess we didn't quite have the word big data then, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I knew uh, Google was the place that seemed to be on, on the top of that. What was it like in the, in the days when you showed up there? It was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, when I joined, uh, a company was three years old and 200 people. And so it was just sort of everybody pitches in and we're always behind and you try to get stuff done. And uh, we have all these resources, we have these great colleagues, and you say, I have an idea, let's try it out and, and see what works. If you look at where, where things are now with Google coming to, even to, into existence in the, in the late 90s uh, and where it is now, it seems rather shocking and surprising. You probably would be surprised yourself yeah. if you could just jump to 2020 and look back. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, certainly, uh, you know, maybe you were surprised when you heard I was going. Other people said, are you crazy? You're giving up a <laughs> job for this startup company? It could go under. Uh, and, and then I said, well, one, you know, they shared some stuff with me, and I don't think it's going to go under. So, so that was right. Uh, uh, I didn't have any idea that it would succeed to were the you level there, that it In 2001, did. that was before they even had the ad uh, system running, correct? So they, they were just putting it in then. So right. I remember the question, yeah. people said, well, Google's everywhere, everyone's using it, but, but what's, your, what's your model? Right. And they said, we'll worry about that later, right. Right? which was fabulous. Right. So they, they had, had just put the ad system in, and, and there were some numbers that were going up and to the right. And of course, it's hard to predict the future, but it looked uh, pretty strong right then. And, and a lot of people hadn't really realized uh, how, how strong that potential was. Now, I actually came on board uh, as a title of uh, Director of Machine Learning. Because I told them, you know, I think machine learning could be important to this company someday. Uh, but after a couple of months there, we realized two things. One was that uh, maybe there shouldn't be a separate department of machine learning that should be integrated everywhere. Uh, and secondly, that they needed to refocus on search because they had taken uh, a lot of the top people off the search team and put them on ads to, to build the, the ad system and had yeah. kind of taken the foot off the gas on search. Uh, and so then I moved over to, to uh, uh, be the manager at the search group for, for five or six years. It's been interesting to watch the investments and even comments uh, even years ago by Google's leadership. I think one comment was, I don't know, it was Larry or Sergey who said, uh, we're an AI company, we just don't realize it yet. Yeah. Something along those lines and to see how central AI is now at yeah, Google. Right, uh, uh, so I think he was way out in front of that. Uh, Sundar has, has lately been saying we're AI first. Uh, a couple years ago, we were mobile first. Uh, I like the AI first uh, motto better, uh, first of all, because it's my field. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But secondly, because mobile first was kind of a reaction. It was saying, uh, you know what, we're behind. Uh, the world is shifting off of desktops into mobile and you know WhatsApp and all these other guys, they're ahead of us there, so we have to catch up uh, in mobile. And, and, and that was a good leadership to uh, remind the company, because otherwise we, we would have fallen farther behind. And, and, I, and I think we did eventually uh, catch on to that. Uh, but the AI first is more of, uh, uh, it's not that we're behind, it's that there's a great opportunity here to, to move ahead. Now speaking of AI, you and I are, relatively have traveled through the same AI worlds yeah. um, over time from the theorem proving and logic centric AI into the probabilistic reasoning. And then we've seen this recent upswing back to connectionism yeah. where we see the rise of the power uh, for perception, perceptual tasks of, of neural nets, deep networks in particular. 
I'm curious to get your your sense for things. I know we've talked before about this, even in front of in front of senators in DC yeah, together right. on these panels. Yeah. But if you can share your sense for for the where we are now uh, in the history of AI and what this means uh, moving forward, uh, these recent discoveries and and um, and capabilities we have. Yeah, I'm still trying to get my my hand around it. Uh, so I did make this shift from logical to probabilistic, uh, along with a, with a lot of the other of the field at, at varying speeds, and uh, and it's hard to give up on that, right? Because you you see uh, the benefits of having that kind of a worldview, uh, and so for a long time I was trying to say, uh, well, these uh, deep networks. Uh, they must be probabilistic models of something. We just don't know what their models are. That's actually what I think too. But, uh. yeah. And and that that's got to be true in some sense, but right. but only in kind of a tautological sense uh, that anything can be can be viewed as a probabilistic model. And uh, and I'm not quite sure that that's the most useful way of looking at it. Right. So instead, now I'm thinking of it more of uh, these are just optimization machines, and you tell it what you want, and uh, they get you there. And it's a very bumpy multi-dimensional surface, so you might not get quite up to the top, but you get close. Um, and so I think now to me, one thing that's really shifted about the way I see AI is like, uh, you know, I've uh, been working now on, on revising the AI textbook, and in the previous editions, uh, we said, okay, we're going to define AI as maximizing expected utility, so utility is important, probability is important, Here's all these cool algorithms that can help you, and you give me a utility function, and I'll optimize it for you. Uh, but now we're saying, well, we got all these algorithms, and they're great, so maybe the optimization is the easy part, but knowing what the utility function should be, that's the hard part. And so now we have all this uh, fairness and accessibility and privacy and so on, and it's deciding what it is that you should want that's harder than figuring out how to optimize getting there. It's interesting because that's always been uh, a, a concern, it, but it's been largely, as it probably will remain, outside of the technical field of yeah. AI. It's one of aligning values, understanding human preferences better. You could imagine tools and learning algorithms that could help people with that, help with that task as well, right. that are part of the technology. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think, I think we need those kinds of tools. Uh, and I've been thinking about trying to uh, broaden the scope of our tools, right? So, uh, you know, we have our TensorFlow tool and, and, and there's other competing tools, but they're really just a small part of the pipeline of saying, uh, I prepared my data here, now I'm going to optimize my parameters and my output comes here. Uh, but feeding into that is where did the data come from, how do you manage it, how do you update it, and then feeding out of it is how do you turn this into a product and, and serve that product and maintain it over time and so on. And that whole pipeline is uh, hard, but we only give you a lot of help for the little optimization step in the middle. And I'd like to see more of a focus on the, the, the lifetime or the, the, the whole pipeline the, the of the whole machine learning life cycle. Yeah. With the rise of capabilities of AI um, and the rise of interest, uh, both uh, among AI experts and, and beyond, civil society, academic organizations, uh, studying different disciplines, whether it be social science and mm -hmm. philosophy, uh, it's interesting to, to, um, uh, to see the growing interest and to even see at our companies, like at Microsoft, we have an ether committee process, working groups, uh, deliberating about sensitive uses of AI, for example, and engineering best practices. Um, what's happening at Google in this space? Yeah, uh, that's a great issue. Uh, so we published our set of AI principles. We spent a lot of time internally going over that, saying uh, what are some guidelines for what we want to do and what we don't want to do. Uh, we're involved with a couple different types of partnerships. Uh, we have uh, external review boards. Um, and we have internal discussions of uh, what we should be doing and not doing. And I think, uh, it, uh, you know, the world becomes more complicated, right? It wasn't that hard to say uh, we want to provide access to all the world's information, and so if there's a web page, you should be able to find it. Uh, that was, was more or less neutral, and, and there were definitely some political issues involved in how you make mistakes with that. Uh, but uh, those are, were easier kind of problems to deal with. And then the, now the problems we're dealing with today of uh, 
Should you be working with the military? Uh, should you be exporting surveillance technology and so on? And uh, so we want to, we're definitely taking a uh, let's go slow. S some things we're ruling out altogether and, and other things we're, say we're saying uh, let's be careful as we, as we think and go ahead. That's fabulous. What are your thoughts about where AI is in 2050, just to speculate? Uh, Cost and yeah. technologies. It's hard to predict, especially the future. Uh, I think uh, we'll see more in our, in our everyday lives. I think uh, you'll see more kind of personalization, both in terms of uh, what you carry with you. Uh, you know, so now uh, a lot of people have phones. Uh, you're wearing a watch. Uh, there'll be lots of uh, prosthetic devices that, that will help you out and do things, and maybe they'll be connected with the rest of the world in a, in a much deeper way. Uh, I think there'll also be backlashes against that, of people saying, uh, well, the way to be really advanced is to just completely disconnect and, and go off the grid. And so I think you'll be see- more human. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll see some, some splits there. Uh, I'm really interested in the robotics industry. Uh, you know, I've been thinking for a while, eventually it's going to take off, and yeah. it's kind of disappointed me in how slow it's going. Uh, you know, if you think back to the personal computer industry in the, say, in the 70s, you could buy a, a kit computer, and it was pretty expensive, and it really couldn't do very much that was useful, uh, but it was fun to play with. Uh, but then within a decade, you know, everybody had one in their home. Uh, and at some point, that transition will happen with robotics. Uh, but it didn't happen last decade, and I don't know if it's going to happen this one or if it's going to be, uh, I mean, definitely by, uh, by 2050 it will have happened. Uh, probably it's going to happen in more in the industrial settings first, uh, which are uh, more controlled environments and also, like NASA, they can afford to pay more for them. Uh, so we'll see advances first there, and then they'll start to trickle down in, into the home, and everybody will have them. What, what are your thoughts on uh, making some fundamental progress on what I like to refer to as uh, the long-term standing mysteries of human intellect, which uh, we've yeah. barely scratched the surface of with all the fanfare about AI. Yeah. Uh, do you think we'll, we'll, we'll make some good progress there, or are we making progress more than we even know, potentially? I think we will. Uh, I, I like to keep these ideas uh, separate, right? And uh, this was also one of the criticisms I had of uh, the work that was going on back like when I was in grad school, right? So I came out of this uh, uh, tradition that uh, was kind of a mix of AI and cognitive science, and it, uh, it always seemed like an excuse where you would say, uh, uh, well, your program doesn't perform very well here. And, and you'd say, oh, yeah, but it's cognitively plausible. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then you'd say, uh, but your program does things that a brain couldn't possibly do. Yeah, but I get better performance that way, right? And so if you're aiming for these two peaks of scientific understanding of the brain and best performance, uh, you usually end up in the valley in between when you simultaneously well, when I say When I say mysteries of human intellect, I mean our ability to learn so well without, in an unsupervised yeah. way, our ability to manage massive quantities and learn, seems common sense, our ability to transfer tasks quickly and easily. I mean, I don't need to go to flapping wings and human-like things, but even, right. even scratching the surface on these capabilities I'm getting at in some ways. Yeah, so we, so we want to understand that, right? We, yeah. we, we want to understand uh, why are humans so good at what they do? Why are they bad at, at what they don't yeah. do? Uh, can we interface with them better, yeah. right? I mean, I, mean, I think we, we all want to be able to have a, a conversation with our computers rather than having to program them in the slow way we do. Uh, and in order to do that, they're going to have to understand us and, and we're, and we're going to have to understand them. And I think, you know, eventually we'll, we'll get to that better understanding. I think some of it will come through AI, some of it will come through uh, neuroscience, uh, and uh, we'll get improvements, but uh, it's hard, hard to predict how long it's going to take. So how, how do, do these advances in AI we're seeing right now with um, learning from massive quantities of data and even now having available streams of data from our applications, how is this going to, do you think it'll affect software engineering and software maintenance mm -hmm. of the future? 
Yeah, so, so that's a great topic, and, and I think things are changing. Uh, part of it has to do with the techniques we use, and part of it has to do with the problems we try to address. Right? So there's problems we can, uh, we can attack now that we could never a attack before. Right? So, so I remember the uh, Google Photos team coming to me and saying, uh, you've got a bunch of uh, user experience experts on your team, and we need some help. Uh, helping people organize photos into folders because they have too many fo photos and uh, they're getting confused. Can you design a better user interface for it? And I said, yes, we do have some of those experts and, and they're great and they could probably do that. Uh, but over here, we've got these computer vision people and they can probably organize the things automatically without you having to do anything. And they said, I didn't know you were allowed to ask for that. <laughs> <laughs> Candy right. shop. Yeah. yeah. And so I think we'll see a lot of these kinds of things where, you know, sort of normal software designers will say, well, I was going to do it the hard way, but here's this magic way that can do something that I could never do before. And so that'll be part of software and that will change things. And then the other part is just uh, improving uh, kind of regular software, right? So like. Uh, Dave Patterson's been working with us on like, uh, well, how do you build an operating system? Uh, well, one of the things you do is you do some experiments and say, well, I think the page size should be such and such when running on this kind of machine. Uh, and then you make that choice and you've hard coded into your program, right? But then uh, you get a different computer or your, your mix of programs changes and now it's the wrong choice, right? So we're looking at, can all these parameters be optimized? Uh, through machine learning and it's still you know humans still writing most of the code but then a lot of these choices get done better and, and can be updated continuously um, then I think software testing changes a lot and I think it's already changing right so it used to be and you know you guys at Microsoft's were the kings of this that uh, once a year you put a disk into a box and you <laughs> put it in trucks and they were delivered to stores and then people paid money for them and brought them home uh, and that meant you had a release cycle that said there's all these tests we're going to run yes. and it's going to be a pain, but when we get it done, there's a golden disk. <laughs> it's uh, right. It's and right. then we're not going to touch it for a long time. But then as we started to move uh, into the cloud and into the data centers, it was more like we're not going to ship once a year, we're going to ship every day. And so that changed the testing cycle. And yeah. uh, you were making lots of small changes rather than big changes. And then, uh, then the third step was when machine learning came in, and now you say, well, now I can have an online process. Uh, and that's kind of scary, right? Because now you no longer have time to run all your tests every millisecond as you're updating your model with live data. Uh, and it's more like a uh, control theory problem rather than a uh, uh, logical testing problem, where you say, I want my system to maintain within some envelope and I want some kind of guarantees, or if not guarantees, at least some assurances that it's going to remain there. But I'll have some monitors to say if it starts uh, getting out of bounds, uh, then somebody better look at it and, and we better do something about it. And so it really ch just changes the way you think about what testing is, how frequently it's done, and what you have to look for. So you can see the, the whole field and even education about software uh, development methodology changing over time. Yeah, yeah. And, and I also think it's important to distinguish between the, the problem and the solution, right? So people criticize uh, machine learning models saying, well, how, how can you really trust them? Because the answer could be anything. And to some extent that's true, that there is some uncertainty in what, in what you get. Uh, but some of that comes from the technique of using machine learning, and some of it just comes from the problem itself, right? So if I... Uh, you know, if I ask you to uh, uh, sort a list of numbers, there's a definitive correct answer, and we can test for that and prove it correct. But if I say, uh, here's a web query, sort the list of web pages that, that are relevant to that query, there is no one definitive answer. So there the uncertainty yeah. is in the problem definition, and whether you're using machine learning or whether you're using traditional programming, uh, that uncertainty is still going to be there. Peter, you, you, you've, you exemplify somebody who has followed their interests and had a, such a fabulous career, still in deep progress, uh, um, magically finding these interesting roles over time uh, where you've prospered. Um, intellectually and socially and in all ways. Um, and you've mentored as you've gone with your writings um, and, um, and, 
and, and work with, with, with collaborators, young people and, and peers mm -hmm. and others. And I'm curious if you have some advice to, to young folks out there about, uh, about career. Yeah. Uh, any any, any uh, mottos or mm -hmm. insights you could share? Uh, well, so one is, uh, you know, I just feel like I'm lucky to be uh, at a time when uh, the kinds of things that we know how to do are things that were wanted. And, there were, and that there were lots of opportunities because the field was growing and so, uh, you know, it's like the, there weren't all that many bad choices. Uh, but I also think that you should follow uh, what you think is right, what you think matches uh, what you can do. Uh, so uh, I have been, been in multiple places. I've had all the top level domains, uh, .edu, .com, and, and a little <laughs> bit of .gov. Uh, and, uh, you know, in grad school at, at that time, uh, I felt like you were brainwashed into saying you really should be a professor. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, now it's much more fluid. People go back and forth, but that was the idea then. And yet I gave it all up. And I think the, the reason I gave it up is because I felt like what was expected from you as a professor was not that well aligned with what I wanted to do. So yes, I, I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed uh, creating uh, educational materials and books and so on and you got a little bit of credit for that uh, but not that much and I was okay at writing research papers and that's really the thing that they focused on and I didn't want to focus exclusively on that and I really enjoyed programming and that was another thing that was not that well rewarded uh, in the academic profession so I said well it looks like industry is a better match because because uh, the things I want to do is, is the things that uh, they reward better and so I think you know kind of follow the path to uh, what makes sense for you where you want it where are you, your, your skills match up with what's needed and I have to ask you um, the folks that don't know you well <clears throat> might think you put on a special shirt for me today for this interview. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the history of uh, and the and, the, and the, the background on these incredible shirts that I always see you in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so ironically, uh, part of it again goes back to NASA. <laughs> okay. Uh, Is there a planet there? I'm looking up in no, 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 no. <laughs> not this particular shirt. But uh, you know, I go to my job at NASA, and actually, one of the things I asked them in, in the interview process was, "Do I have to wear a tie?" And they said, when you go to headquarters, yes, but uh, when you're uh, at Ames, no. So I said, okay, I, I can handle that. You know, I'll wear business casual. And so I do that. And then my first Friday on the job, they say, no, not business casual today. Today's dress down Friday. You have to wear a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> I like that demand. Yeah. yeah. And I said, uh, you know, I'm not really into that, but okay, I'll start exploring that. So, so I did that and I was at NASA for a while. And then I guess the real turning point was uh, uh, my wife's handy with, with uh, sewing and she had made uh, like Halloween costumes for the kids and stuff. And at one point they said, uh, how come you never make anything for daddy? And so she found this great fabric, which is a print of uh, classic 1950s tin toy, uh, toy robots uh, and made a shirt out of that for me. And so that was a great shirt. And I remember one day uh, we were doing a photo shoot at Google, uh, I think it was for Fast Company. And, you know, they'd already done Larry and Sergey, so this was like the next level down. Were they wearing their black turtlenecks? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, this was me and Susan Wojcicki and Urs Holsey uh -huh. or something like that. And they said, okay, come in and, uh, you know, we have to take some headshots and there's going to be like four people on a page. And I show up wearing the robot shirt and they say, oh, you get a full page. <laughs> I see. So it's a good thing. So huh? from then on, I said, oh, you know, I, I can train from examples, and uh, you get a reward function. So uh, for that, I said, okay, no, you know, this is, this is now my trademark. Fabulous. It's a great trademark. Thanks very much, Peter. Yeah, it's been pleasure. Great chatting with you. Great.